make it. So at this point, I say, hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. But that's not today, right? I'm not saying that today. Um, thank you for uh, for for coming today. Um, I And thank you if you're watching this on the recording. Thank you, too. Um, really looking forward to our conversation. Um, Diana's got some very interesting headgear on. That's pre presumably that's why she got on the video. Um, so... Uh, what we're going to do is we've got about an hour together, so I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, spend about five minutes with each of the panelists, asking them some questions. Then we're going to run through some questions uh, that we've had uh, from from you on email, and then we're going to open it up at the end if we've got any more time uh, for question to answer some questions. And so when I'm asking the questions. No, let me forget about that. Scrub that. Let's just get straight into it. So we're doing it by uh, alphabetically, the panelists by their by their uh, by their first name. So um, Joyce, would you unmute yourself, please? Do you know how to do that? Bottom left, it is on the screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Joyce. Um, Looking forward to this conversation. Uh, is this a rude question for you? When did your advocacy begin? Well, I think as an adoptee, it begins at birth. Wow. I think that uh, we're, we really are put in a place where we have to educate others about adoption from the very beginning. But I would say my real advocacy began in my late teens, early 20s, when I decided to search and I advocated for myself. I needed to know who I was and where I came from. So that that I would say that was the first. Yeah. And that led me to advocating for others. And I went to the legislature and started to work on access to original birth certificates in my state. Wow. Wow. So those were the beginnings. Yeah. And so how, how has it changed over 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 the time because you're still doing so much for us and uh making some great connections helping me, me with some great connections i really appreciate that well i think it changes over time in various ways and it goes forward and two steps back and forward and one step back and two steps forward and i think the surprise might be that you never stop that there is always a need for advocacy. Even the things you thought you did uh, need to be recycled, reworked, represented. And um, so I think it's very important to do a lot of psychoeducation, to bring a lot of people into the movement, to help people to find their voice and um, to do the best we can to reform the things that are miserable about the system of adoption the business of adoption yeah and what what uh, other than the fact that it, it's an ongoing it's an ongoing never-ending uh, cycle in this process what would you say has been your biggest learning about um uh like uh, uh, making our advocacy more effective what would you say to people what would you share what information would you share what guidance would you give um, for somebody looking to uh, up their game in terms of uh, well, in terms of, I don't think this is for the faint of heart. Um, you know, I mean, I, I I think I was pretty much a pioneer in terms of mental health and adoption, and um, you know, had the first clinic in the United States that wasn't connected to a placement agency. It was strictly available to people in the world of adoption. Um, and I, I think that it's really important to be ready to take whatever you get because it, people are not always going to love you. Um, there are many, many situations in the world of adoption where I know I've done great work, but I've been vilified for it. And uh, then the next year I'll get an award for the exact same thing from the exact same people. So I, I think it's really important that you, you realize what you're doing and why, and you stick to it even through adversity. And there's a lot of adversity out there. We're working with a system 
and a group of people who are traumatized and um, there's bound to be difficulty in the process. Yeah, I mean, I'd echo that in terms of like the patience and the persistence. Surprising, you're getting different feedback from the same people on different years. Um, sticking at it, so like I've done 400 odd, 450 odd episodes now of the podcast, and we're to, and we're we're closing in on I think about ninety thousand episodes, right? So all that work, I just keep on keep on at it. Uh, and for me, the the most important thing is the quality the quality of the conversations, not the quantity of the people um, uh, the quantity of people downloading it. Um, and uh, that so that's been probably my biggest biggest thing but that's the biggest insight that I've had in terms of sticking with it and realizing for me to realize it's about quality rather than quantity and that was um that was a, a fellow adoptee called Vin uh, from down in Australia he he pointed that out very clearly to me but I keep on getting that message at a deeper and deeper level you know it's it's this focus on the quality it's this patience and this persistence uh and uh, we just keep on going so thank you uh thank you Joyce is is uh, Moses have we got you here is Moses are you there Maybe Moses isn't there. Okay, so we'll we'll skip along. Um, Sa I think, yeah, I think, yes, I'm here. Oh, yeah. sorry, Moses. Yeah, okay. So uh, he's unmuted himself. So um, uh, could you mute yourself, please, Joyce? And then uh -huh. hopefully uh, Moses will uh, we'll see we'll see Moses. Soon. I haven't seen his face. Hi, Moses. <laughs> I'm I'm. Hey. Hi, Simon. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. It's good to see everybody here. Yeah, great to see you here. So um, when did your advocacy begin, Moses? Uh, I'd say for me, as soon as I heard about the conditions of the orphanage back in South Korea, my, my first instinct was wanting to go back and help my fellow orphans. Yeah. That was, that was my thought back when I was five or six years old. Wow. Um, but professionally speaking, uh, I I came into the world of adoption, like the adoption profession, uh, back in 2010 or 2011. Uh, I worked for an adoption agency, and then I was introduced to uh, an organization, a group called Access Connecticut, where they were advocating for the access uh, for birth certificate yes. records. Uh, in in Connecticut, so I'd say that that was my formal uh, act of uh, advocacy uh, for birth certificates, and um, uh, since then uh, I've I've been fortunate to connect with and 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 meet up with uh, a, a number of people who help me understand. There's a larger context to the, to my own adoption experience, and. Uh, uh it's it's a real pleasure to be on this panel with um with Joyce I I'd indicated that I had gone to her training back when I was being introduced to to the field so uh so it's a real pleasure uh to be connected this way around advocacy so what would you say has been your biggest learning so far in terms of this uh this journey this advocacy journey that you've been on um, and obviously you, you you do a lot of work as a therapist, right, as well. So what would you say has been your biggest learning so far? Uh, well, that therapy is only the tip of the iceberg. Um, and uh, it, it has helped me to expand my, my sense of uh, responsibility, obligation. Um, I, I, I threw in the chat uh, the question of, is it, is it a necessary part of the adoption experience for myself? And I and I think uh, uh, Joyce was just speaking to this, that uh, in a way it is because uh, for so many of us, it, it does start with our own uh, self-advocacy. Uh, and for me, it's it's been a journey of seeking the truth of it all. And the, the, the more people I've spoken to, the more that I've read, uh, the more clients that I've seen in my practice, uh, I've just learned that there's many, many layers to this larger context of the adoption industry, 
um, the, the, the crimes behind adoption that I now speak to. I, and I have, uh, I, I'd say over the last five years, spent um, uh, my time uh, looking at all aspects of uh, the intercountry adoption uh, uh, market, uh, as well as domestic, as well as foster care. So every every angle of how this industry operates, uh, I've wanted to explore and dig really dig in deep. Uh, you know, just how 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 uh, expansive and um, um, so yeah, I. Uh, at this point, uh, I, I've gone from advocating specifically for adoption trauma issues uh, to understanding, well, where is that exactly coming from? So the mental health aspect of, of uh, the, the attachment um, and uh, abandonment traumas that we, we often speak about. Uh, but I've expanded to uh, the human trafficking elements of uh, uh, of the adoption industry, and most recently, I I'm now speaking up about the um, uh, the crimes of uh, adopting and, and murdering children. Wow! Big so I so, so yeah so so I find it uh, Im important to ask ourselves what is it exactly that we're advocating for, yeah. or fighting against yeah. yeah indeed thank thank you very much moses um could you uh, mute yourself and perhaps uh sarah could you unmute yourself yes okay hey so when did you you start doing your advocacy work sarah um yeah i i just want to say what an honor it is to be on this part of this panel and this lineup um yeah so thank you simon for pulling us together um yeah just legends like joyce and susan i just want to echo what moses said it just feels uh, just really amazing anytime i get a chance to hear um hear from from joyce um and susan i'm so excited to be in a room with you um and you too moses so thank you and thanks to everyone who's here um so yeah, I feel like an advocacy junior compared to uh, the people in this room. Um, it, for me, um, probably the first advocacy was advocating for myself by writing my memoir, um, and and you know claiming my own story, and then um, my outward advocacy kind of was a fruit of that. Um, when my memoir was nearing publication, I began getting more involved in the adoptee community, building relationships and friendships and um, getting an understanding of the lay of the land, what's been done, how others were contributing and where there were some gaps. Yeah. And um, how, how has it changed now? Because you've, you've, you've obviously you made a real big splash with the, the, the book with your uh, with your partners, you know, um, is that is that the main change you've seen and you've doing you because you're doing all the work with the uh the writers as well helping other people write the memoirs yeah i would say that that um kind of both of those initiatives kind of started together hand in hand um i tend to be a i don't know passionate problem solver um, so when I see areas where I feel like I can support, or if I encounter things that frustrate me, um, that I don't think should be so frustrating, I tend to jump in. Um, a lot of my advocacy work is through my writing. Um, and that's where I feel like I can really take time and reflect and sort through problems and come up with solutions. Um, adoptees being misunderstood is kind of a big passion of mine. I don't like that we get misunderstood so often. Um, I'm pretty passionate about adoption narratives that don't serve anyone. Um, and then just adoptee loneliness. Um, I, I, that's just something that kind of, I, I just don't like, um, having experienced it myself for so many years. So, um, you know, publishing my memoir was lonely and challenging. Um, I was bumping up against publishers who were saying it's amazing, but adoption books don't sell. Um, and so for that, that, that frustrated me so much. I was like, nope, you know, um, I was seeing that adoption books were selling, but maybe not necessarily so many that were written by adoptees. So that's how Adoptee Voices um, is, became a part of my advocacy is to support other adoptees in their storytelling and 
um, helping to show that there is a marketplace for well-written um, adoptee literature. So that was a big thing. But again, came, coming out of that frustration and the passion and then adoption and filter kind of came out the same way um, of just feeling frustrated that, um, that, you know, adoptees are so often misunderstood or pathologized. And so wanting to explain emotional dynamics as I had understood them through my studies of attachment and child development, and then um, make some headway um, by pulling others in the constellation together and like just feeling frustration of why can't we reach, why can't we reach across the aisles that make some change? So, um, so I would say that's kind of my advocacy work and, um, and where it comes from. Um, it's changed over time. There's a lot, a lot, um, tends to be more speaking than, than, well, I wouldn't say then writing, but the speaking has kind of come in hand in hand alongside the writing. Um, trying to do more listening um, when I can and learning and seeking my mentors um, and then being a mentor where I can um, and where there's, um, you know, an invitation and a desire, um, lifting up others who are new to this work, younger adoptees, which is really important because, um, you know, the human emotional dynamics are the same, but the adoptions changed and, um, you know, there's, there's, that's important to, to help um, support others who are new coming in. Right. And just briefly, your biggest uh, learning, I'm trying to, sorry to, uh, I'm trying to keep it as on track, but um, what, what would you say has been your biggest learning over the years? Oh my gosh. Um, you know, I think just having mentors and trusted confidence are crucial. Um, Jennifer is in the room. She's one of my, um, you know, just having your people, um, your, you know, your, your people to keep you sane and grounded, um, and, um, your allies and, um, and to, to, you know, listen and to be with you and alongside you cheer for you. And, um, you know, and I think that helps with your discernment that helps with keeping you grounded um, you know, I think, you know, a big thing is not everything should be shared. Um, and sometimes we need time to process things before they're shared and before we can help. So I think I would, I would say those things. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And, um, thank you for keeping your answers, uh, uh tight. Just want to leave, uh, doing my best to manage the time table today. Um, so, uh, so Sue, Susan, are you, could you, could you unmute yourself, please? Hi everyone. Hey. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, Sue. Um, so oh, of course. when um when did your advocacy begin, Sue? So my advocacy started after my adoptive mother died in 1989. So I would say fast forward a few years, 1992, I had joined uh, Dr. Joyce McGuire Pavo's uh, pre and post adoption consulting team. Um you know, from 89 to 92, I was really struggling as an adoptee and really not understanding what was going on with me. Now that my mother had died and grieving another mother, like who would have known that when your adoptive mother dies and you don't know who your first mom is, that you could be grieving a couple of parents, right? Or all your parents, right? So um, my advocacy started in 1992. Um, and how has it changed over over time? So, um, so my focus of advocacy um, is through um, it, it's really about sharing with people the normalcy of being transracially adopted. So. Back in the day, being a transracial adoptee, uh, many people didn't even know what that was. Um, you know, I was surrounded by no no other transracial adoptive family. I didn't know who I was. And so for me, it was really about making sense of my experience um, as a social worker and then sharing it with other folks to share those narratives of difficulty like what does racism look like as a transracial adoptee? What does my racial identity look like as a Jewish triracial transracial adoptee? Even making sense that I was a triracial transracial adoptee, I had to figure that out because I wasn't quite sure what I was. 
Was I just an adopted person? Was I, was I a multiracial person? Was I a multiracial transracially adopted person? So those kind of figuring out, uh, all of that needed to happen back then for me. I mean, it was just really trying to make sense of what I was, who I was, you know, why I didn't fit in, you know, where did I fit in? Um, and so my advocacy was through unpacking some of the most comp complicated parts of my existence, my being, and then sharing it for others to understand how complex this is and that this complexity is normal, which is, you know, Joyce has this normative model, right? Um, and, and hope that that would help others as they go through, right? Like other transracial adoptees as they're trying to make sense of other, to other people who they are, that maybe some of these professionals would have heard me and said, oh, you know, Sue just spoke of that, right? Sue shared like, this is very normal given being transracially adopted, be, being multiracial, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and so it was really about sharing my inner self with others. Um, how my advocacy has changed over time is, I'm much more, I mean, I'm very solid in myself at this point because it's been decades. Um, and my advocacy went from, um, doing these solo acts to kind of joining in with other people. So like I might present a narrative while someone, um, like Joyce would speak about the topic of the narrative. So it's like my first year in foster care. And then Joyce would do a kind of academic piece on that, like on that kind of, or, or uh, more from a practice standpoint. Um, so I started joining with people, which made it uh, uh, fun in a way, right? Yeah. So it goes from like being by yourself on stage, right? Um, to sharing the stage um, more regularly with other people to kind of share that with everyone else. Because it, it, it can be um, intimidating and threatening still, yeah. you know, depending on who your audience is. So you, your biggest learn, learning over the, over the decades? Is my biggest learning is regardless of me speaking about these areas for the past couple of decades, um, I don't think it's sustaining the, you know, what you've, you, you put out there. I think that there has been change. It's been a lot of change in the adoption world as far as how people understand you know, people are able to talk about racism and, and know that that's expected, right? Like we know that we can talk about racism. We know we can talk about complexity of racial identity. However, racism doesn't end, right? Um, people and how they view adoption, um, no matter how much education has happened, people still need to be educated because there's so many folks who just don't get it still. And so what I find is, is that it's just like a never ending, um, uh, this is just never ending as far as teaching and training and, and advocating. Like you just, it just needs to continue on. It's like you, we could all just pass the baton to the next generation and say, here it, here it is, your turn, keep it moving, you know? Keep it going. And hopefully that's what we're doing today. So thank you very much. Um, so maybe if you could mute yourself. Um, and then, uh, so now we're going to go into the we're going to go into the questions that we've had. So I was thinking how we could do that. Um, so I'm going to read I'm going to read the question out, and then uh, I, I've kind of got in my mind who I'd like to kind of lead on that question, and then so uh, we'll ask if that's okay with you. We'll ask that, uh, and then uh, anybody else has got anything. If anybody else has got anything uh, di different from that. And um, then they can they can chip in. Um, Jude, could you Jude, could you mute yourself because the um, the 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 back of your head keeps on coming up on the on the screen. So um, the first question is from Diana Taylor, and these are big questions, right? I mean, I really could do we could do an hour on every one of these questions, um, but we're just going to do the best that we can. Uh, maybe five five minutes on each one. So Diana Taylor writes, how can we collectively foster a more inclusive and supportive environment for adoptees that acknowledges and, address and addresses their unique experience of trauma, identity and belonging 
whilst also advocating for systemic changes to better protect their rights and mental health. And I'd love, um, maybe we could start with you on this, uh, Joyce, if you're up for that. Would you be up for that? If you are, if you maybe you could un unmute yourself. Yeah, um, there, all of this discussion deserves so much more time. So I, I just want to say that this is like a tiny tidbit of things that you're getting from each of us. And, um, but it's something. Um, I think that psychoeducation and policy work are very, very important. Um, as Sue said, the more people who are educated about this, and it has to keep happening. So psychoeducation is extremely important. And working on policy to change what's going on, as Moses is doing in some, as we're all doing in various areas, and I think that that's extremely important. And what I've learned in my 90,000 years of being in this world of adoption and this field is that um, it's very important to somehow have parallels. If you're a clinician, if you're working with individuals or families in adoption, you can do policy work, but you can't bring it into the therapy in the same way that you might think you could. Um, because really, you need to be where the client's at. And there are many people who get upset because some clinicians who are adoptees are working with adoptive parents or they're working with birth parents. I think Sarah's book covers this quite nicely. Um, but I, I do, my goal is to work especially with adoptees and especially with the little adoptees. We need to do whatever we can to protect them from the things that hurt us. And so the more we can do for the little adoptees, the better. And in order to do that, we have to work with the adoptive parents. Um, we have to help them to change and to be able to see what's going on. And we have to work with the birth parents because when this opens, and it will, um, I, I think reunion to me is open adoption just a bit later. So all of the work that we need to do with all of the parties involved has to be done in a way that really provides the education and the support for the kids. For instance, just a quick, and, and I know we, you need to move on, but one of the things that's really important, I used to do these conferences on the Cape. Uh, in Provincetown, they were called the Adoption Intensives Archaeology. And um, one year we had a group of social workers from England. We were doing a lot of work with after adoption in the UK. And um, many of them came over for the conference. And they were very much against transracial adoption, totally against transracial adoption. And guess what? Most people in their right mind, believe that if possible, all children should stay in their family of origin. If they can't, they should stay in their culture and race of origin, their community of origin. Um, all of those things are very, very important. But what about the kids who have already been placed transracially? And what if we don't believe in gay and lesbian adoptions, but we have kids in families that are gay and lesbian? You can't use your politics against a family that's already made and that needs nurturing and a child that needs to be held. So there's a way that we have to separate those. And I'm always advocating for doing the work, believe me, I'm all for completely deconstructing adoption, possibly getting rid of it and calling it something else because it's so terrible what we've done in that in that project of adoption. But the families need to be held in a certain way. And the children, most especially, need to be held. They're the centerpiece. So cool. muting myself. So, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to change this. We, we, we got four questions, so we're going to ask each of the, the guests one question. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to post all the questions. I'm going to put a different a, a Facebook post for each of the each of the questions. Probably, you know, like I'll drop them one a day uh, afterwards, and then we can carry on the discussion. 
because this is clearly depth and we're just um as as uh, joy said we, we're just at the surface on here so um so if you could uh, mute yourself please joyce and then uh, the next uh, next question i think uh, sarah i'd love you to take a run at this one please um so this is from uh from linda Peebach, uh, also known as emma stevens um and her question is how can we best try to fine tune our adoptee message and keep from keep from fragmenting as we happen uh, as we see happen in so many other move, uh, movements. So, um, could you uh, could you un unmute yourself, please, Sarah? Yeah, great question, Linda um, slash Emma. Yeah, really good question. Um, yeah, it's a really important question because we have seen that in a, a all. <laughs> I I. I I don't want to be um, too broad, but maybe all movements where this does happen, um, especially when you've got politics and passion involved. And as Joyce mentioned up front, um, you know, a lot of hurt, tra traumatized people in lots of different ways. So um, I think, you know, my answer to this is assuming best intent. <laughs> Um, and giving each other grace. Um, panels and conversations such as the one we're having today, Simon, thank you for doing this. Um, groups where those of us doing advocacy work can talk together um, to learn from each other, to get to know one another, to support each other, um, to mentor each other. Um, you know, just the power of community. It's harder to attack when you know somebody, when you're not hiding behind a screen and, um, you know, a fake name and an avatar that's not you. Um, you know, you're in community, you're being real and authentic. And you you then know that most of us, if you're in this work, you're, you've are you got in good intentions. <laughs> um, and so then you can, you can see those intentions. Um, and then just another reason for community is it's just so often where creative solutions um, rise. That's, you know, it's, it's, it's the birthplace of creativity um, and tackling things together. So I like what Susan was saying about, um, you know, I find that too, just the, it's fun being in, you know, conversation with others. You just don't know what's going to come up. And it's, it's really exciting that energy and that passion when a lot of passionate people get together. So I think um, just more of these, please, <laughs> would yeah. be my answer. Brilliant. So um, thank you. Uh, if you could um, mute yourself again, Sarah, and then um, I, the next question is from uh, from Terry uh, Terry uh, Dreismeyer. So I know you're on the on the call, Terry. I'm gonna I'm I'm going to uh, shorten the I'm going to shorten your question because you're asking some all of these questions are big, but it takes us down slightly different routes. So if you bear with me, I'll answer. Uh, I'll I'm going to just abbreviate your question, Terry. Um, I, don't, I want to respect you clearly, and then maybe uh, maybe um, Sue, Sue, you can take a look at this one, um, uh, the, this next question. So, Sarah, if you uh, mute yourself, and, and Sue, if you unmute yourself, please. Are we there? Sounds good. Okay, cool. Um, so, um, what do we do? Right? How can we take a more proactive approach for adoptees because um, they're facing like a cut, uh, she, Sarah's uh, talking about uh, adoptees and, and their families facing a cookie cutter care treatment of, of Medica medication and talk therapy from physicians and therapists who lack understanding of specific adoptee issues. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my thought about that is, is that, you know, I, there are so many adoptees around the world and there are so many adoptees in the United States and they really, um, their voices are pretty powerful at this point. I mean, I, I you know, when I started out, it, we didn't have a voice very much. I mean, Joyce had a voice, but she was one of the few adults who did like in this, in this uh, area. So what's happened now, we have a lot of adoptees who are well-educated and they're in all the various professions and they're writing, like they're writing um, books around like 
how to prescribe, what to not to prescribe, like what's ethical, what's unethical, working with uh, adoptive families, you know, and that really kind of falls into the pathology, right? Like if, if we don't educate psychiatrists and psychologists and the mental health profession, and they're the ones who are treating mm -hmm. us, they're not going to look at us as if this is quite normal given the situation as Joyce and other folks have pointed out is we really need to provide that psychoeducation. And a lot of that's being done. It just needs to continue um, and really move away from these diagnoses that children get that carry, that carry on into adulthood. Right. It's like hard for a child to attach to a parent, right. If they've already kind of moved from one home to the next, to the next, do you really need to give the child a diagnosis or is it, more that we need to heal, you know, the last relationship and do some searches and help connect this child to their, their history, to their past, right? Um, and so I think more of the psychoed um, in the area of the mental health profession, which I know many of the adoptees are now doing, there's a lot of LICSWs, a lot of mental health professionals. Um, I think that that's going to help, help with that area. Yeah. So just to, to uh, chip in on on the um, on, on on the adoption competent therapists. So uh, Chaitra has a uh, a directory. I think it's called uh, Beyond Learning Beyond Words. I think is a website. Anyway, I'll I'm, when I send the link out to the to the replay tomorrow, I'll put a link on that. And, and, you, and these are mainly adoptees who are doing. Uh, therapy with other uh, with uh, fellow adoptees so you know that they have that kind of that lived experience um terry also asks about um uh, some about mentor uh, mentorship so i'm going to address that uh, on the email tomorrow and i think uh, there's a few people that i know could a few organizations that i know can kind of signpost to and, and some people that are doing um mentoring Specifically, the one that comes to mind is uh, Jessica Lucery in on the East Coast. So she's in in New York. She works for adoptee transracial adoptee works for um, Spence Chapin. Um, and I think Angela Tucker does too in right. Seattle. She does she's got a the mentoring Coast. program. Brilliant. Okay, um, and I, I think uh, you know this proactive approach is. It is taking control for our. It is taking control for ourselves. Uh, I interviewed a for the podcast yesterday, and somebody said like it's about self support. It's like we we can we're we're going to have to instigate it, right? So we're going to have to do do the work and find the people that we need to help us along our um, advocacy journey, helping along help us along our healing journey. Uh, there was yeah. We we need we need to take the uh, we need to take the initiative, and um, and talk amongst ourselves, share amongst ourselves. You know, like anybody looking for anything specific, um, via an email at me uh, or or at, if you're happier to do that, you know, with one of the people on the panelists, the panelists will will do that, right? Um, so uh, let's let's keep the conversation going on and um take it take it thank you so thank you very much uh sue um you you've you've uh, muted yourself um moses uh I, i'm gonna uh if you could unmute yourself i'm gonna ask a question from uh, jennifer who's who's here on the on the call i'm still here you're still here cool brilliant um uh <laughs> so uh a a, a, a different a change of tack a different so this is from jennifer dine ghoston and she says what does self-care look like for you? Jennifer, thank you for this uh, uh, question. This is a very important part of advocacy work. Um, I, I know that we've indicated uh, sometimes it's important to take breaks, uh, to come and go. Um, uh, what it looks like for me has uh, taken on uh, a lot of uh, work around self-awareness. So understanding how I'm uh, getting activated by people who come after me, 
I have learned how to manage that for myself. Uh, I've learned the importance of having uh, a very tight inner circle of uh, uh, support people. Um, anytime that you decide to put yourself out there in the public eye, know ahead of time that you are going to be scrutinized, you are going to be challenged, uh, that there will be dissenting viewpoints, uh, that that comes with the territory. So uh, that's the other side that I, I'm not sure if people consider that to be self-care, but for knowledge of what you're stepping into, and I think that that was something that that was brought up earlier. Uh, so you know what to expect, you know how to prepare for, you know what you're stepping into. Uh, that is, in my opinion, a very important piece to self-care so you can continue uh, what I am uh, what I'm doing for myself is leading a mission driven life at this point, a purpose driven life. Uh, so, so much of my energy and effort and attention is on specific areas of advocacy that I'm focused on, that this is beyond me, this is beyond uh, uh, anyone else's uh, singular uh, viewpoint, that, that there is a mission uh, to be accomplished, there is a mission to be uh, served, uh, there are people who are out there uh, suffering, being abused, and uh, going back to previous points about uh, serving the children, um, <clears throat> my my uh, focus these days is uh, the fact that they are being uh, abused, tortured, and, and murdered. So uh, that is uh, finding a greater good, something beyond yourself, beyond your, your own sense of self-advocacy, that uh, that has been helpful for me to understand I have to keep going. I have to keep showing up. I have to keep speaking up. Uh, there are, uh, as we indicated, millions of lives on the line is the way that I put it the, these days. So by attaching myself to a greater good like that, uh, that is what is important to me and not not any personal attacks, although it does hurt. And I do reach out to people and I do um, uh, have have the feeling to run and hide uh, often, but uh, by uh, finding a mission that is important to you, that is personal to you, uh, that has been helpful for me to keep going. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. Um, Susan, do you want to chip in? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to add about like the barriers within the adoptee community. Um, I've seen a change in for the better in the adoptee community, which has been really beautiful to kind of witness. And um, it was very siloed uh, when I started speaking and just kind of moving around in the space. It was kind of like whites here, you know, uh, blacks, you really couldn't find them. They were kind of really just scattered across the place. Um, large Korean community had already gathered. Um, and, you know, like there's some populations, Native American really wasn't formed. Um, you know, from India, the, the, the um, folks from Asia, just kind of different parts of the world. Uh, it depended on where you were from and whether or not you had a formed group. Okay, um, over time, uh, the adult adoptees have really kind of discussed this topic, have kind of thought a little bit, kind of spoken about like the silos. And I've really seen probably, I would say over the last seven or so years, much more integration, like just much more collaborating across racial, ethnic, lines, which has really been awesome. I, I do think we're going in the right direction. Yeah. Right. So maybe you could mute yourself, uh, Sue. Um, it has, is, is there anybody else like to ask a question on maybe a topic that we've not covered so far? If you want to raise your hand. Uh, 
Okay. Well, we'll go somewhere different then. Um, wait, 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 wait. Oh, so, sorry, Kathleen. Because I can't, I sorry. can't manage the slide so quickly. Just was, because <laughs> I'm jumping here and there. Okay. I'd like to add something to this because a lot of people. Hi, everybody. First of all, hi. A, a, a lot of people, a lot of people are mentioning the uh, high rate of suicides. And if there are no suicides, then there are suicidal so thoughts in many ad adoptees, yeah? And living, a lot of adoptees live with hopelessness for the future, helplessness, and this, you know, uh, you know, a constantly traumatized state. Now, the, now, this is what I, I think it's an emergency situation to discuss, but, uh, uh, the adoption itself is a traumatizing experience. It uh, basically reframing the self and the identity, at, you know, at birth or after birth, it reframes who you are. Yeah. And then, when, when, and then a lot of people end sorry. up in the. Can I, and then a lot of people. Sorry, can I stop you? Can I stop you? Could, yeah. you ask a, could you ask a question and maybe tell us who you like? Yeah, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm getting. Yeah. So a lot of people end up in the mental health system and the mental health system is itself a traumatic experience. And the mental health system itself induces and causes suicide, including the medications, suicidal thoughts and suicide. So this is not, this cannot be, and please tell, tell me what you think about it. This cannot be a therapeutic process when you are pathologized and traumatized within the mental health system. This, this, is, this is a second layer of trauma. This has to be stopped as okay. soon as possible. So could, could you frame a question yeah. and who you'd like to answer, ask it to, please? No, I, I just wanna, I, wa I wanna hear about, you know, from the panelists, because the second layer advocacy is, with, is within the mental health system. Okay. So, um, do you understand what I'm saying? I, I do, yeah. I, I think so. Moses is is he's raised a hand. So, and I was going to say this is this is definitely one for you, Moses, given what you've already shared today. So, um, uh, Kathleen, if perhaps you could um, mute mute yourself, and uh, Moses, yeah. unmute yourself, and um, maybe you could uh, take a take a run at this question. Big question, very critical yeah. question. Mm -hmm. Uh, Catelyn, uh, thank you, thank you for speaking up and making this point. It is an ongoing crisis that absolutely needs to be addressed from the entire adoption community. Uh, so uh, this is something that I know many of us here on the uh, uh, adv adv advocacy panel um, has spoken up about, advocated for spoken to so but in in leading off uh, about this uh for for me my my journey about uh suicidality uh with my own uh with the three siblings in my family who uh have uh, died by suicide uh, it, this hits uh, hard uh, and very close to home, obviously, for me. Uh, so uh, understanding the intersections of adverse childhood experiences, the, uh, the outcomes that they, uh, that they brought up about uh, if you have four or more uh, adverse childhood experiences that you're at a higher risk of 1,220% uh, of attempting suicide. Now, combine that with the existing uh, suicide uh, um, uh, studies uh, directed at the adoption population, we're, it's, we're saying four times more likely uh, among, among our population uh, it puts us at an, an incredible, incredible high, high risk. Uh, so I advocate uh, to have uh, more direct research being done, more studies being done uh, within 
especially within the adoption research community, that I, I have not found uh, anyone ticking this up um, uh, with all the research that is coming out about adoption, the industry, the outcome data that continuously comes out uh, from each state. Uh, I would like to see uh, more efforts being done both within the community and also organizations like the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, uh, as well as the American Association of Suicidology, the, these organizations provide research and provide research in, in the way of uh, leading to policy uh, reforms and, and protective measures, preventative measures. Um, so without all of this, we're not able to effectively advocate because we don't have data, we don't have information, we have anecdotal uh, stories, which I'm seeing, uh, as you pointed out uh, here in the chat. It, 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 so uh, it would be uh, vital to have a coordinated, organized uh, campaign that uh, really puts us on the map. So thank you for pointing this out. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, crucial stuff, right? Um, has, has anybody, is there anybody else that'd like to uh, ask a, a question? If they could raise their hand. We've got uh, eight minutes. We've done pretty well on time, actually. Done pretty well on time today. I was pretty scared that I wouldn't be able to corral everybody, but everybody's playing nicely, so that's good. Anybody else ask, like to ask a question? Okay. Uh, so, Patrice, would you like to uh, unmute yourself, please? Yes, I'm going to um, thank you all. I said in the chat that um, I feel like I'm with my folks today. So thank you all for having this forum and for being here. Two things. I want to say something really quick. Moses is spot on. This has been in my thought process of probably really strong for the last two weeks about how do we organize to get into other systems? It's enough for, I keep going to these meetings where we talk about amongst ourselves about um, what needs to be done. Um, I recently at my company held a, um, uh, in another, uh, myself and another adoptee held um, as an uh, as a employee resource group topic we infiltrated and had um abby wingham come and talk about how transracially being adopted um affects how you show up at work this stuff we know what we know we need to infiltrate the systems so that we are a dive we, i can consider us an area of diversity and inclusion and adoptees need to be included, and it's exactly what Moses is saying, um, and at, you know, the age, you know, or the mental health association, there needs to be a speaker that goes there that talks about this. All this needs to be in all curriculums of all social work practitioners, um, you know, in the um, academic space as a profession, like this is, stop, you know, we need to be on other people's podcasts talking about this, not just our own. I love our own, but it's it's, it's not enough anymore. And I think, um, so my question is, yes, we're all scattered. I would like to see number one and join up with anybody who sees this as a diversity um, issue and see if we can start to penetrate these things, start to be on some of these other podcasts, start to be on different things so that we can make this area because the truth of the matter is, is that people do not see adoption as an issue. They just do not see it. They see the glory of it. They see it as a positive alternative until we infiltrate, um, you know, enforce ACS, Administration for Children and Families, to put a clause on that website and the Children's Bureau to say, 
you know, these are some of the adverse effects. You can do this, but these are some of the, and I know I'm calling for something real radical here, but I'm all for it. So I don't know if anybody's down, but this just talking amongst ourselves, um, I love y'all and I always will, but we need to get out there. Anybody agree? Yeah, I think we all agree, Patrice. Um, this is, that's kind of the reason that I did this event, right? To 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 bring people together. Um, because so for instance, like, was the children's bureau were they invited? Like was you know the the American Heart Association, all these different associations, were they invited into our space for us to tell them that they need to add us as a diversity area and inclusion, have us start to sit on their boards. Have us start to, and, and you know, I'm on the board of, of CASA, matter of fact, in New Jersey. And let me tell you what I said. I said, I'm going to roll off of here, but when you're looking at diversifying your board, there should always be an adoptee on your board. Yeah, You should never do this work without us being on there, period. You should not. So I I don't I don't see how you can have a casa and not have somebody who was in foster care and adoption on your board if you're doing the work right. I I did a actually did a lot of outreach last year to to companies to to on their resource groups and have had a few conversations, but unfortunately it didn't it 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 didn't go it didn't go where I wanted it to go. But I think everybody could do that. What you just said, if you're employed by an organization. You, uh, a, a, you know, an, a large organization that got resource groups, then you can put this forward to the uh, put this forward to the HR department. It's a great. And they're not going to see it as a, something to continue until a national campaign highlights. And I'm sorry, I'm going to go there. The suicide rate, the 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 the, the issues, the mental health issues. And, and all of that, they're not going to to embrace it until they see the the debt the detriment that this has caused. Yeah. Well, we're on about time there, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so uh, I just want to. Is anybody any anybody on the panel want to come in with some some closing comments, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Um, if you've got if you've got questions right that you haven't had a chance to answer uh, ask email when i send you the email to the recording tomorrow email me the questions and i'll and i'll put them on the face i'll put them on my facebook page i'm going to drop i'm going to drop one question for as long as a, a day for as long as it takes to do that right because i i appreciate that you haven't had a chance to ask all your questions so uh, anybody on the anybody on the panel like to uh, uh, bring it home for us? Simon, I, I don't know how to put my little hand up. I kept trying to hear do you. that. We can hear you. Uh, I know. I just I, I decided I just had to unmute. Um, I, I, there's so much more that we could talk about. And thank you, Patrice. Um, this has all been done, but it can't only be done once. I work closely with the Children's Bureau. They give out a huge amount of grants for foster care and adoption. And at the end of that, those things are placed in a library and never replicated and used throughout the country. And there are some very good projects that get never see the light of day again. So it needs to be done over and over again. And we took it upon ourselves in the 80s and 90s to go to the judges to speak at their golf courses when they were having their annual meeting while they were drinking their cocktails and to try to get them to understand what was going on in the child welfare system and what was going on in adoption. So lawyers and judges and educators and pediatricians and psychiatrists all need education about this. And there's very little done and it needs to be done and redone. And there is a pathologizing model. It's a medical model. And it, it's what leads to all of this medication and this, you know, diagnosing that is incorrect. The, the situation of foster care and adoption makes it look different. 
it makes it look as if the child is the problem when the system is the problem. So I, I think you're absolutely right, Patrice. Many people have worked on this, but it's not enough. It has to happen continually. So uh, thank you for all your time. Thank you for all your comments. We will obviously be back again here. Uh, I'll take time to reflect on, uh, talk, to the, uh, uh, talk to the other panelists. Everybody wants to su suggest what we do for the next session. Um, keep the, you know email me and we'll we'll figure a way to keep it going but um need to kind of keep this uh keep a kind of structured approach hopefully um keep us all together and uh thank you thank you very thank you very much for the panelists and for everybody for attending uh lots of love to you all yeah take thank care you, simon you're welcome thank you cheers bye. thank you simon thank you bye bye thank you bye. simon uh, you're welcome you're welcome. Lots of love. Cheerio. Got a ring with mum now. <laughs> Thanks, Moses. Thank you, everyone. Thanks Amazing so meeting. Well run. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Simon. Cheers. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Bye.